Is voice working? Has anybody spoken yet? Uh, I think you have. Yeah, all right. We might as well go ahead and get started. I like the bird thing. Is it new? Alright, well, let's see what's going on. Uh, we are still doing QA on Asset HTTP Viewer. I'm uh, hopeful that'll be going out next week, but we will uh, we will see. Uh, as usual, depends on the uh, QA side of things. Um, let's see. Other than that, uh, we have been continuing work on the um, animated objects that's coming along nicely I've got uh, I've got a setup now where uh, it actually connects up correctly to the simulator a correctly configured simulator so that uh, anybody who's running the appropriate viewer can uh, can see what's going on so that's uh, that's a nice step forward from where we were last time um, the it's still a ways away from an actual working project viewer, though. Uh, there's one one issue is that if anybody who's not running a supported viewer visits the region, they will crash immediately because they see a message they don't recognize. It turns out we don't handle that very well. Um, so we need to make things a little more robust that way. One interesting thing about uh, this is the question of where the um, where the skeleton's supposed to be positioned. Uh, if you think about the way things work today with uh, avatars, the skeleton kind of gets positioned first, right? We start out with the the agent position that the simulator sends us, and then we uh, position the bones, starting from there and and doing some jiggling based on hover height and and getting trying to get the feet to touch the ground and various things. Um, so that then uh, whatever whatever rigged objects you wear then get positioned relative to that skeleton and the skeleton is kind of authoritative uh, now it's kind of the opposite of that right you're starting out with an object that already has a defined location and you're trying to figure out what the correct location for the the bones is supposed to be um, and uh, it's not entirely obvious what the right way to do that is um, yeah, right now I'm I think I'm positioning the pelvis bone at the uh, at the location of the object um, which sometimes gives you a pretty good fit and sometimes you know when you start animating it it takes this sort of jump in space where the the skeleton isn't very well lined up with the object position um, so it's uh, 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 it's not uh, it's not 100 percent obvious what the right thing to do is there you know should we just pick a convention and then kind of expect people to to build their content accordingly or should we be trying to do something smarter where we're trying to do kind of adaptive uh, stuff based on the, the location of the skin vertices and that sort of thing um, generally what I would about... tend to favor the simplest approach but uh, uh, yeah go ahead Oh, I was just thinking, um, of course, there's already scripts in SL and stuff for um, animating prims, not rig. So maybe, um, I don't know how they do that because I'm not a scripter or anything, but maybe we could do it along those lines as to, you know, kind of go with the flow of things. I don't know if that would work or not, but it's just a suggestion. Yeah, I, I mean, the stuff I'm aware of, you have the ability to animate based on... Um you know, just setting the the position and the and the rotation of of the individual prims, which you know they already have their own their own idea about that, which is fine. the The problem here is that uh, you know once you start treating it as as a, a skinned mesh, then it its position basically gets overridden by the position of the bones that it's being skinned to. So the question is kind of how that's supposed to get lined up. 
does uh, the skeleton... Did we all crash? Uh, yeah, I think maybe the region crashed. Yes. Everyone got disconnected. I saw the time dilation dip down really quickly. Yeah, I heard you maybe when you said, oh, I think I crashed. <laughs> yeah, sometimes the voice doesn't go away right away, so you're still connected to voice even after you've lost your uh, connection to Second Life. Oh, I was going to ask, um, does the skeleton not have uh, an origin bone or a root bone? Uh, it does have a root bone. Um, and then, uh, you know, the pelvis is connected to the, the root and everything else is connected to the pelvis or descended from the pelvis. So we could position things relative to the root or relative to the pelvis. There's some special case handling, I think, for both of those. I mean, it seems like the origin would always be, or that root bone would always be the ground. Or at least you would animate it that way. I think that's the way it normally works, that the root is kind of the ground position, and then the pelvis is, you know, by default set a, you know, a meter or so up from that. If the someone says the pelvis is animated, then it'll be offset from the root pause. Uh yeah, that that would be the that would be where you'd be animating relative to. Yeah, uh, so, I mean, the, the issue isn't so much that the client-side mesh animation affects the position of the object from the sim's point of view. Um, you know, the sim doesn't really care that the animations are running. Um, the, the question really is about where it should be displayed, you know, in world. Um, you need to, you need to position the, you have to put the skeleton you basically have to create a skeleton to go with the object, right? And then you have to put the skeleton somewhere, and then uh, the object's uh, vertices are going to get kind of wrapped around wherever that skeleton is. So then the question is, what's the what's the optimal position for the skeleton? <sighs> yeah, there's a question about collision. Um, yeah, collision is a kind of interesting question. You know, currently we don't really do collision detection on skinned objects. Um, I th I think what we probably are going to wind up doing with that is to have collision detection based on using the collision volumes of the skeleton, but uh, we haven't really started investigating that yet, so uh, it's it's still kind of an open question. Yeah, these questions are why I was thinking if we had an actual prim be the root, you know, and so that you have an actual physical prim that has collision and can be, you know, scripted or, you know, have physics affect it um, and could even be made invisible to be made into the, you know, so people, could, so things could bump into it to give it actual uh, physics, you know, um, mm -hmm. um, mass. Uh, I was thinking that because... Um, wouldn't it be easier to for like a prim to detect when it hits the ground, so that you it's always in contact with the ground if you want it to be? Uh, yeah. I mean the the prim kind of knows how to figure out when it's hitting the ground. 
you know, relative to its own uh, its own shape, but it's that doesn't necessarily line up with the the shape that you get when you do the the skinning, right? Well, that's what I'm saying. It's like have a have a regular prim be the root, and then you have your pelvis bone be relative to that root. Um, so, you know, theoretically, you could put uh, a, a prim at 128 by 128 on the grid, and you could then animate that the rest of the skeleton to move anywhere in that grid if you wanted. If you just wanted to leave the prim in one spot, um, you know. Um, it, it wouldn't, you know, um, or you could have um, the prim actually move, like such as, um, what is that, pathfinding? And then the skeleton would move along with it. So it would give you, like, two different options. Uh, yeah, we we got to look at that. I mean, there is there is a prim now, right? The, you know, a, a, a mesh object is, is also a prim, um, or, you know, it could be a link set that contains multiple prims. Um, but uh, you know whether we could tie that in with a physics object as well is is something we should probably look into. Right. I was. I know all skinned objects are basically phantoms, and that's why I was thinking if we had a, an actual prim as a root, and you could resize that prim, the prim itself could be solid, you know. Um, but the 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 skinned object, you know, that is connected to the skeleton. Uh, is still a phantom, so you could kind of get two for one. Um, the, the actual prim has can be made solid; people can bump into it. Um, you know. Um, anyway, it's just a thought. Yeah, it's probably something we should look at. Um, you know, so far everything I've been doing is just related to trying to get the animations to play and and get communicated successfully. Um, you know, we haven't really looked at the the kind of finer points of how the things like collision are going to work, but uh, that'll be definitely on the list. Awesome. Yeah, you know, one thing I'm hoping is that it's possible to take an existing mesh object and, and you know, turn it into an animated object. That, that obviously opens up a lot more possibilities. Um, you know, rather than forcing everything to be re-uploaded and, and uh, you know, in the process that would also shut out anything that, uh, you know, people didn't still have the original source files for. Um, so, you know, the way I'm handling it right now is you can just take, uh, you know, a, an existing mesh object or a, a link set and, um, you know, basically an inventory item and then, you know, flag it as, a, as an animatable object and, then it you know kind of gets the new behavior and the new the new messaging. Yeah, uh, uh, well, yeah, it has to be rigged and weight painted. I mean, it, this would only apply to something that's already a skinned mesh object, but then just uh, have the ability to turn it into uh, a, an object that can be, can be animated independently of, uh, of an avatar. Well, if you had a, a the prim be the root, you could right mouse click on the prim. And then select where, and then go into your inventory. Um, not, you know, so you're telling it to wear whatever you're seeing in the inventory. So it's like you're telling the the prim to wear this mesh. Then it could wear any anything that's already previously uploaded. That's Rick. Yeah. So you're thinking that the you've got a prim that's that's not a skinned object. But that's the root, and then the uh, basically the existing link set becomes you know children of that. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Um, and and if you wanted to hide the prim, you would simply make it one hundred percent alpha. Or if you wanted to make that prim a phantom, you could. So it would give you the option of using the prim as as you know something people could bump into. Or you could make it, even even though it's invisible, 100% alpha. Or you could then use physics on it. Um, you could use pathfinding on it because it's just a regular prim that the skeleton just rides along with yeah. it. Wherever it goes, the skeleton goes. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if you can already have a physics shape tied into, uh, you know, to an existing 
skinned mesh object, um, but uh, that would be something to look at. Uh, it, it there was a question about having multiple uh, skin mesh, multiple rigged meshes. Um, yeah, that that should work. Uh, you know, we have some some mesh models out there that are actually multiple pieces, right? You've got a uh, you know an upper body and a lower body or whatever that uh, I think are actually separate objects that are in a link set. Um, and uh, so you know the idea there would be that there's one skeleton for the whole link set, and then all of the um, uh, all of the the different uh, components of the of the link set get animated by the same skeleton. Yeah, it seems like there should be a lot of possible ways to kind of mix and match different pieces and, and still have things work. We haven't done a ton of testing yet. I'm just working with a, a you know, a one-piece model, but uh, we'll, we'll do more digging into that as things develop. Frame rate, uh, I'm not seeing a huge impact so far. You know, I've had some tests where there's a bunch of objects all going at the same time, and, um, you know, they're not, if they're not very heavy weight objects, it doesn't, uh, doesn't matter too much. Um, you know, I'm expecting the impact to be similar to what you'd expect from, uh, you know, a similarly rigged avatar, but, uh, you know, again, it's uh, at early stages, we don't really have definite numbers on that. Yeah, there's a question about editing size. Um, yeah, that's one thing that I, th that I think would be interesting is if we could, uh, you know, use the size of the object to sort of guide the uh, the size of the skeleton. Um, so you could make your, uh, you know, you could make a, a you know, uh, you know, a, a riding bird and a, a miniature riding bird that follows you around or whatever but um uh that's also uh, uh that's also tbd what the what the details are going to be yeah you know, we could just use the bounding box um Yeah, the the thing about it is that you've got, you know, if you kind of look at the static object, you you think about what the skinned mesh looks like when there's nothing to skin it to. There's not necessarily any connection to the scale there. Like we've had, you know, these these hundred meter tall. Uh, uh, I think there was a case where something was like 
was imported in the wrong coordinate system or something, and so it wound up being, you know, 100 feet tall or something. And, um, you know, you really couldn't tell when it was uh, when it was attached, because it, was it would get scaled down to fit the skeleton size. But if you just rezzed one on the ground, it would be this like you know towering monstrosity. So, um, you know, if you're trying to use the kind of unskinned behavior of the object uh, or the unskinned dimensions of the object as a guide to something, then, um, you know, the people would have to actually kind of look at that when they're when they're creating their meshes and, and not just look at what it's going to be like when it's uh, when it's actually attached. We could be crashing again. Uh, great. Yep. Now I'm going on about the con jump, con jump move. Oh, I was going to say I know I'm talking about the prim root thing idea uh, again, but you're talking about scaling. Would be interesting is if um, if the scale of the skeleton was tied to the scale of the root prim, so that way uh, different animated objects could be scaled up larger or smaller. So say you had a herd of deer or something, or a, a herd of zombies or, or werewolves or something, you could scale them up bigger and smaller to make them different from each other, you know. Um, that would be interesting if it, uh, if it was tied into, say, the, your basic root prim uh, would be, you know, uh, one meter by one meter by one meter, and then if you scaled that up to two meters by two meters by two meters, it would then make the, the skeleton twice as big. Uh, yeah, unfortunately the problem right now isn't that the viewers are crashing, it's that the region is crashing, so uh, even if you if your viewer stayed up, you'd still be losing your connection to the location. Uh, that person in the corner is back again. That... Gunemer 78. All right, well, let's attempt to meet. Um, so, I don't know, we were somewhere talking about uh, animated objects. Anybody remember exactly where? And I can't move. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, we're dead again. Yep. I can still hear everybody. There's another two-day-old arrived just before that happened. And I'm gone. Still here. Oh, I'm still here. I'm not here, but my voice is. Should we move to another region? I can turn, but I can't walk. I can't move. If we find yeah, another we'll region, that'd be awesome. Vaughn, voice, voice will just stay connected for a bit, but we're dead. After all. <laughs>
running away. <laughs> running away. Uh. <laughs> I'm, I'm floating up here. I have no gravity. We have uh, scripts off, so you may see some behavior being a bit different. R yeah, right. If you're wearing some attachments that rely on scripts, that's what's going on. A problem up here? <laughs> All right, well, let's uh, try to carry on here. Um, let's see, so we've also got uh, baking updates going on. That is That involves a bunch of kind of infrastructure work to get, uh, which probably wouldn't be of a whole lot of interest to the group, but just for your information. Um, we're, we're doing a bunch of uh, updates to get uh, the baking service working on newer versions of Linux and Things like that, um, and then with some uh, some updated uh, uh, related software. So anyway, that's coming along. the The first step there is just getting the baking service updated to handle uh, higher resolution images, and then uh, you know once that's working, there we'll need a corresponding viewer update, and uh, then we can start looking at the actual feature work for supporting uh, bakes on mesh, which is the the ultimate uh, point of the exercise. Texture big will disable normal spec maps. No, or nothing is uh, nothing is changing about normal and spec maps. But the thing is that the baking service doesn't support normal and spec maps either. So um, basically, whatever you uh, whatever you generate as a result of doing the baking is just going to generate the the diffuse texture that gets applied to your object, and then the the spec and normal maps are are just going to get resolved the same way that they always have. But yeah, you can still have uh, spec and normal maps just like you do today. It won't uh, won't change at all. Good. Uh, yeah, right. You can't you can't bake two or more normal maps together because the baking service doesn't know anything about normal maps. Uh, you can have you can define a single normal map uh, uh, the same way you can currently. Uh, how will it be delivered to the mesh? Uh, so the idea there is that you would have a way of flagging a face on a mesh as saying, you know, use a baked texture for this face. Um, and then if you've got that flag, then it will use whatever the current big texture for that avatar is. So if it gets updated, then it'll you know, display a different texture. And if you uh, and what will get persisted is not the particular texture, but the fact that it's flagged that way. Um, so when you, uh, you know, relog or whatever, you'll get your, your current big texture in that slot.
A uh, question about bakes on mesh. Yeah, right. The the idea is that uh, this would work. This uses the same textures that are getting generated now for traditional avatars. So you can have, uh, you know, your skin plus a tattoo plus, uh, you know, layers defined by shirts or jackets or whatever. That all And it all gets uh, kind of layered one on top of another to generate what's called the baked mesh, which is the kind of result of combining everything. Um, and uh, so the idea with bakes on mesh is to be able to flag a, uh, a mesh object as, as also wanting to use those textures. So you can have, uh, if you have a, a mesh object that has compatible texture coordinates to a system avatar, then you could uh, potentially use the bake there too. Even if you didn't have a compatible coordinate, but you just define things your own way, you could potentially still use it too, although it would make the uh, textures a little confusing when you're trying to look at them on, on uh, wearables or whatever. So, yeah, the, you know, one point of this is to help with the onion avatar problem. It, it lets you combine textures rather than having to layer meshes on top of each other. Um, alpha channel, well, the alpha channel would uh, would be included in the in the baking process, right? I guess actually the alphas are a separate uh, separate wearable, aren't they? Stuff gets uh, gets alphaed after the fact. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the images have to have alpha channels or you couldn't text them on top of each other, right? You just, you'd always just see the top texture. Yeah, there have been some interesting proposals for doing this with uh, uh, more extensive uh, kinds of things, you know, not just skin meshes that are being worn by avatars, but uh, being able to request bakes of arbitrary textures and apply them to other things. Um, I think there's some there's some possibilities there, but it's uh, that would be a little beyond the scope of what we're uh, trying to do with the initial feature. The first goal is to tackle avatars, which, uh, you know, is the lowest hanging fruit because we already have a baking system that knows about dealing with avatar textures and probably also has the most benefit because we have a, a long-standing issue with, uh, you know, these layered avatars that are, give you very inefficient content. Is the big texture as a feature not necessarily dependent on animated meshes? Um, I mean, it's, you know, it depends on having skin meshes. It doesn't, it's not related to the animated mesh project, you know, the thing that I was talking about earlier. Um, we can, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be kind of released on its own schedule and isn't tied to uh, this, uh, this work on being able to have independently animated objects.
yeah, the persistence is a uh, is an interesting question. Um, you can have, uh, you know, when when bakes are generated by the baking service, um, you know, they're they're kind of temporary. They get uh, you know updated and and I don't know if they actually ever get thrown away, but at least they're uh, obsoleted when the when the avatar contents change. Um, whereas here you you uh, if you have something that you want to be uh, uh, you know a persistent uh, persistent item, it's it's kind of a different logic than what we have now. Yeah, and you know, I'm sure that the speculators and normal maps would also be nice. The the reason that we're not looking at it initially is because the baking service, uh, you know, doesn't have them. It was, you know, not only does the baking service not know how to deal with those kinds of uh, textures, but the the wearables themselves, the clothing items that are being combined into these layers, also don't know anything about speculators and, and normal maps. This the whole system was defined before we had those. Nice. Still add those manually to an object that was receiving the big textures, I, I'm assuming. Uh, sorry, can I say it again? Uh, okay, um, so say you have a, a, a mesh avatar, uh, a custom mesh avatar, and you're receiving the baked textures from your real avatar, that you could still apply those other specular to spec, spec maps and um, uh, normal maps to that custom avatar. It would just have to be applied manually. Yeah, right. You you can certainly still continue to use spec maps and normal maps. Um, what you wouldn't have... Uh, you know, automatically is the ability to combine spec maps and normal maps from, you know, from multiple components so that your, you know, shiny armor goes over your, uh, you know, bump map nightgown or whatever and, and it all, uh, it all gets resolved. Correct. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Hey, uh, nothing new on supplemental animations. That's uh, it's in the queue, but uh, uh, haven't uh, haven't done anything with it yet. Oh, I see that uh, Anchor Linden has joined us. I should uh, should introduce him. He's uh, he's joined us uh, just a few weeks ago and is working on on uh, Second Life development now. And he's working on the texture bake uh, stuff. The uh, the bakes on mesh, which uh, initially means working on the uh, the updates to the baking service. So hopefully I'll be able to join us for some of these meetings and uh, just uh, wanted you to have a chance to say hi to him. Hi guys, how are you doing? Are you sure he's safe here? Uh, apparently those of us without bears are in big trouble.
Uh, sorry, which boxes are we talking about? Uh, populating all at once instead of uh, one at a time? Is this for editing materials? Or for uploading meshes? Uh, I was thinking we actually had some kind of naming convention, but uh, it's been a while since I looked at any of that. I uh, would certainly encourage people to file a JIRA if they have a request on that kind of thing. It's hard to hash out the details in a, a you know, just a discussion, but if we have something written down, we can, uh, we can talk about it. I would actually encourage people to upload more meshes, particularly making sure that they have actual LODs for all of their LODs. <laughs> Set LOD at a hundred. We should probably set all of the uh, coarser LODs to actually be more detailed just to be on the safe side. Encouraging people to do a better job with mesh LODs and physics. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, that's one of the things that we're going to be looking at in the context of updating the uh, avatar rendering cost calculations. But uh, anything else we can do to encourage uh, you know, good citizenship and good models would be uh, uh, would be worth thinking about. You know what? It's it's easy to um, well, it, it's at least relatively easy to add checking where we you know look at the number of triangles you know defined for different LEDs or that sort of thing. Um, it's of course it's much harder to actually assess the quality. Um, you know, if people have a target number of triangles, they can still fill it with garbage, however many or few it is. I think basically as long as, long as there's a, an easy way to make sure that the that uh, you know people think the lower LEDs are never going to be seen, they don't have much incentive to try to make them good. Of course, rendering a uh, million poly model in a by two pixel square in the corner of your screen is just insane. Oh. Yeah, that's uh, definitely not a great solution.
in my LOD series, I specifically tell people not to do that. Oh, sorry. There was a comment about scoring them lower. I'm curious uh, what's the, what the context is there. Are we talking about the score in terms of the OTAR rendering cost, or this is like some additional thing that gets added to the, uh, you know, added in the marketplace automatically or something like that? Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of the uh, the LOD adjustments. I mean, really, it's uh, it basically it should be up to the system to figure out which LOD is correct to display based on how big it is on the screen. Um, you know, to to for someone to just have an aesthetic preference for trying to do something that's physically impossible. You know, basically cramming you know 500 pounds of pixels into a one pound bag just uh, uh, you know. It, it doesn't make any sense. All right, well, it looks like we're at time, uh, so I guess we will see everybody next week. Oh, Fear, before we go, I do have an announcement about Myostar. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, um, I finally have gotten the update done for Myostar, uh, so it will be up and available uh, in just the next hour or two. Um, so I finally, <laughs> it's finally, finally done. It doesn't have the dot .anu, or it still hasn't finished that yet. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to say is I finally also do have my uh, Maya voice control program up for sale and I'll put the link to um, my website for those who are interested in it um, to check it out. There's a, a, a 5000 voice command version that's fairly expensive and then there's a, a much lower uh, 125 command uh, version which is much much cheaper. Um, so but anyway I'll put a link to that um, in the chat group. So thanks Fear. Yeah, the voice control thing also uh, also sounds really cool. Yeah, it was a lot of work. Cool to do something that for that uh, in a viewer, so you can control different things in your viewer by using your voice, like saying inventory, and then the inventory pops up, or fly, or something you want it to fly. And then so, somebody walks by and says, "Delete all items." Yeah, you definitely have to have a safe word. It's probably worth noting that Avastar is on uh, RC10. So um, that just came out the other day. So if you're using Avastar, you probably want to download that. You're seeing any major differences from the previous uh, versions? Uh, just a lot of bug fixes. Um, buttons actually do what they're supposed to so yeah I uh, so I agree that the question about LEDs a lot of it is kind of education we could probably be doing more to you know to to publicize exactly what people are uploading when they're uploading it and uh, uh, you know, to publicize it more in the marketplace as well. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of interesting possibilities to explore, but uh, we'll have to figure out what the the best thing to do is. Uh, no, so, uh, just a note on that, too, that when the customers uh, kind of understand 
what they're buying and and what's good and what's not or what's efficient and what's not um you still you will see them make a move um i mentioned before that some bloggers were talking about how many polygons some of these uh, mesh bodies were so when you get some of these big bloggers talking about this stuff um it can go pretty far Yeah, I think it's important to, for people to understand the, uh, you know, the consequences. It's it's easy to think that uh, well, more you know, more polygons means better quality rather than uh, you know, more polygons just means you know, more slow. But uh, all right, well anyway, I should uh, I should head out. We can uh, continue the discussion next week. Well. I'm going to turn scripts back on now, so, uh, yeah. Good luck. Thanks, Fear. Stand back. <laughs>